Welcome to That's a Good Question, a podcast of Peace Church. This is a place where we answer questions about the Christian faith in plain language. I'm John. I get to serve as one of the pastors at Peace Church, and I also get to serve as the weekly host of this show. Our purpose here is to help people grow in their knowledge of the Bible and their walk with the Lord by answering their questions. And today I am here with Pastor Ryan. Hey, Pastor Hi, Ryan. Pastor John. How are you doing? I'm yep. doing good. I'm the lead pastor here at Peace. And That's right. Excited to join you for Today's discussions. That's right. We got some great questions here. Yeah. So uh, we're going to jump into a few different places in scripture and answer some awesome questions, but we'll start with this one. All right. Here's a question. Is it okay to give 10% a tithe that's split between church and other Christian organizations? All right. I know there's a ton we could say about this. Let's split it into a few different uh, questions. Pastor yeah. Ryan, first, um, what does the Bible say about the tithe? Does the New Testament talk about a tithe? So yeah, that I'd say that is that's a multifaceted question that they ask there. So, uh, so I think what you see in a very general way, and there's there's different ways you can begin to dive deeper into this. But generally speaking, when you go back, the tithe belongs to the Lord. The tithe is holy to the Lord. Tithe obviously connected to the word tenth that we are to give God ten percent of what He's given us back to Him in in praise and worship. And so that is kind of that's a very broad general principle that you pull from the old testament the question begins then um does that translate then into the new testament i think it's kind of what you're you're Mm -hmm. getting at right yep and so does it translate into the new testament not as a mandated law no um part of what christ has done for us through his life death and resurrection is he's freed us from the law he's freed us from a faith that's bound by um uh, a legalistic approach to our faith that we have to do certain things in order to maintain salvation or favor with God. So the tithe is no longer a legal spiritual requirement um, for believers in the new Testament, like all the old Testament laws God, uh, Christ has released us from that. Um, so the question that I think is, is okay. So what, what is the place of financial giving in the new Testament? Is that kind of, I think where we're going? Yeah, totally. Um, so just to just to say a little bit more about even just the Old Testament part of it. So Genesis 14, first passage in the Bible that talks about a tithe. Abraham gives a tithe. Um, and then it's talked about in many places throughout the rest of the Old Testament. Um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get to this as we talk more about this. But I would also just add right away, it's important, I think, for Christians to realize that in the Old Testament, the tithe was only the beginning of the giving that Israelites gave to um, to others. So the tithe was 10 percent. They They usually gave that to the temple. Um, but then there was alms and other things. I've heard it said that that yeah. the Israelites probably gave more like thirty percent of their overall income. Yeah, as well to, over twenty percent. Yeah, to to uh, the work of the temple as well as to the poor and and things like that. So, um, so while yeah, like you're saying, it's not um, it's not a specific direct law that might carry over. Uh, but the principles there are are valuable and important and point to even more giving than. 10%. Yeah, and we see this a lot in the in the ways that certain laws translate into the New Testament that the law doesn't carry but the principle does in many ways even even heightens. And so um like you know not only are you not supposed to um you know not hate your neighbor, you just love your neighbor. Right. Or, right. or they not not you're not supposed to not just hate your enemies, you're supposed to love your enemies. Yeah, Jesus takes um, it up a notch. Jesus yeah. Jesus always takes it up a yeah, notch. You've heard it said don't commit adultery, I tell you the truth, you know. If you even you've, look at a woman lustfully, you've committed adultery. Right. Yeah, exactly. So there's principles that carry over and not just carry over but often expand. And so um when we talk about financial giving in the New Testament, I think we all you know immediately want to go to talk about what are some Bible passages that give us some direction. Mm-hmm. For that, and I think some of the two of the most profound ones come from Second Corinthians eight, chapter eight and chapter nine. Mm-hmm. Paul is talking about the generosity of another church, the Macedonian church, and how even in their poverty they gave extravagantly, and that it sets a that sets a standard for Christians that if we believe the gospel is the message of, of salvation for the world, how can that not take priority in our life in every way, including our giving? And so, you know, so to, to talk about just, I, and 
here's, I just need to always say this whenever we talk about money and talk about tithing there, I can never, and I'm telling you that I'm batting a thousand on this. I can never talk about money without getting some sort of response from people the next day. Um, if not even after the service, you talk about tithing, you talk about people's money. They always want to talk about it. They mm-hmm. always want, they always have a follow up. I've said this to you before. I could talk about the flames of hell and I won't get a, I won't get a single follow up the next day. Um, <laughs> But I talk about someone's someone's money, and they've got a lot of thoughts they want to share on that. Well, with that in mind, you can you can send your complaints to Pastor Ryan. Yeah, at, no, Pastor no. John. Yeah, <laughs> uh, our producer uh, Mitchell over here can take some of yeah, them too. That's right. So, um, I mean, what are some of the other angles you want to take on that question? Yeah, um, well, yeah. So let's dive in a little bit to some of the text of the New Testament talks about giving to the church. So one of the ones I think of is Matthew 23, where Jesus is, uh, is critiquing the Pharisees and he's saying, you, you know, you tithe on your, uh, on your dill and your mint and your cumin. You know, he's saying you, you tithe even on these plants that you, that you pick out of your garden. Um, and then he says, you ought to do, um, more of the latter, but also do the former. So you ought to, you ought to do the, the other works of the law, uh, the works of justice while not neglecting the first, the tithe. So Jesus, so Jesus does talk positively about the tithe that, um, that it is important that Christians continue to give. And so, yeah, no, I, I think what you're saying, yeah, that's the thing. I'm pretty sure it's Matthew 23, 23. Yeah. When Jesus talks about, yeah, you guys tithe even on your spice rack, but you've forgotten the weightier matters of the law, such as justice, love and mercy. And so like you're saying, Jesus spoke positively of the tithe that, uh, we are to give what God has given us. We are to, to use for his glory. Um, I'd also think one of the big, big ones is when Jesus is observing the widow and she gives her last penny and uh, you know, he's with his disciples and he says that woman's given more than anyone else has given. And it's because she gave all that she had. She literally gave her last penny. And what's important to note about that is she didn't give it to the poor. She gave it at the temple as a form of worship. And Jesus affirmed her because she, she didn't get 10%. She gave 100%. Mm. Um, and so as we're talking about, then the pattern that you see is that the collection happened at the local gathering of believers. And in the new Testament, when Paul's gathering offerings and tithes and in financial gifts, it's always in the company of believers. It's always in the company of those that you gather and worship with. And those monies were always used for ministry purposes. And so, um, while there is no, uh, mandated law of giving 10%, I think what you see is a pattern established in the Old Testament that the New Testament continues to expound on and, and strengthen. And I have, I have no problem being open about this because we we believe that in, from Scripture. My wife and I, we give way more than 10% of our income. But our first fruits that we talked about earlier, our first 10% is always going to be to God through the local church because I think that's the clearest example that you see in the New Testament. So our first 10% is given because that's what we've prayed and believe God's calling us to give first and foremost as our first fruits. We give that to the local church. And then on top of that, we continue to give over and above 10% to other Christian organizations, to those in need, or maybe continuing to the local church. And um, again, that's, that's because we want to live the standard that we think that the Bible sets it so that we can be an example to others. Right. Yep. And that's, that's kind of what I think we're trying to, we're trying to balance that emphasis of on the one hand, we don't want to be legalistic. Right. And say that because that's what happens as soon as you, as soon as you specify a number, your, your people are, people either will naturally fall into legalism or you'll be accused of right. a legalistic approach. Right. So that's what, yeah, we're trying, we're trying to dance the line here, but on the one hand, we don't want to be legalistic uh, about that 10% number. And yet on the other hand, we don't want to ease it and just say, Oh, you know, Totally up to you. You do whatever, yeah. you know, whatever you want. Because we know, we all know the human heart. Our human heart is looking at how can we give less? Yeah. No one is coming to this question saying, how do I give more? Where can I give more? Um, or what, what biblical justification is there that I get to give more? You know, yeah. people, people in their heart of hearts, they want to figure out how can I give less? Or they find excuses to give less. I don't, I don't like how the church uses the money. Therefore, I'm not going to give. And usually I say to those people is if you, if you think that your church is mishandling money, or not using it rightly, then you need to find a new church. Sure. Um, but I think what often happens is the heart of heart of people is that they, they try to find ways to give less and less. When I think the standard that we see is that 
we have to give more and more. Christ gave every ounce of his blood. Um, we see Jesus give it all. We see the disciples go and give their lives for this. How could we not give more? And 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 and, if, and, and given, let's just say that the, the ten percent was the standard of the Old Testament. How could we in the New Testament or New Testament believers who are on this side of the cross? How could we not want to give more now that we know the clarity of the gospel? Now that we know the the clarity of the gospel yeah. of Jesus Christ that He lived, died, and rose again. How could we not want to give more to see that work continue? How could we not want to see um, our local church be financially not just like making it, but thriving. And again, like we are nowhere saying like, if you give, God's going to bless you financially back. That's not part of it either. That's the flip side of this, that I think it can get real dark real fast. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, yeah, let's talk about that for a quick minute. Um, yeah. So we, you know, we don't have a money back guarantee on our tithing here at Peace Church. We don't get up and say, uh, you get your money back if you don't get uh, a blessing out of it. Um, and so, yeah, like you just said, we don't, it's not like, hey, oh man, I, you know, I've heard people tell these stories of I gave to church and then the next day I found a twenty dollar bill and I had only given fifteen dollars to the church the day before. So see, the <laughs> Lord, the Lord blessed me more than I gave. Well, I, you know, it's not. I would say that you will absolutely be blessed um, when you give because I would say that all Christians are blessed by the Lord. They're blessed with the Lord's presence. Um, so hear me when I say that. I think you know in Scripture the word blessing does not just refer to financial things. Right. So uh, you will be blessed. Um, That blessing might not come until you're in heaven with the Lord, or that blessing might come in a totally different way than financially. There is no guarantee that you will be financially, that you will receive a financial reward for giving. Well, I think that's actually what you are doing is that when you do give, um, you're storing up treasures for yourself in heaven. Right. You're kind of sending your money ahead of time is kind of what the the treasure principle talks about. Um, I was also going to say, and I, I can say this from my own personal experience, and I know I know what this is going to sound like to people, but I have to say it because it's absolutely true. I cannot outgive God. Like yeah. I cannot outgive give God. It is like every single time we up our giving, God finds a way to bless us abundantly. And I'm not saying that's a one for one correlation that's going to happen in anyone else's life, but I am saying that when we move forward in faith and we financially trust God and we give abundantly, He blesses us abundantly. And maybe that's just through our giving that God's given us the eyes to see how he already was blessing us. Maybe um, I'm just telling you with honest to God truth. And I have to say this because it's a testimony that's been true. God out gives my wife and I every single time mm. we up our giving. Mm. And it, I'm not saying it's, it's always in the almighty dollar, but I will say it's always in some form, some material form, whether that's food or maybe it is money. Um, we cannot out give God is literally like it's literally like, and I don't want to like test God, but it's almost like, I want to like give it all away and see what God does. Mm. Um, Cause he's already proven to be so trustworthy um, in all this. And like the blessing, the blessing is, is like, I get to be a part of the group that says, we're going to make sure that the church is financially stable. Like, mm. I, get, I mean, that's a, that's a blessing to be able to say, I'm part of the company of people that are ensuring that, that God's, uh, that God's church remains stable. And it doesn't mean because we gave X amount. It's because we gave faithfully. You know, the single mom that gives faithfully out of her poverty is part of that company too. Um, it's those who in their wealth are stingy and find reasons not to give um, who should be concerned. Sure. But We'll be right back after this break. Hi, I'm Elizabeth, one of the co-hosts of Mom Guilt, a podcast with new episodes every Monday. Mom Guilt is a podcast about the daily struggles of motherhood. Stephanie and I share real experiences of mom guilt and how we have found freedom from that guilt through the gospel. Listen to us on resoundmedia.cc or wherever you find podcasts. Yeah, so you you shared a little bit about from your own personal experience, so I'll share that too. I think as Stephanie and I, as my wife and I look at um, scripture and look at the Old Testament, we see that tithe principle that um, you know, whether we view that as a absolute requirement in the New Testament or not, we see that as an important principle. And so for us, that's the start is that we say even before taxes are taken out, 10 percent goes to the Lord. Um, that that's not that's not like a, a bill we pay or that's not um, stacked up among other expenses that we just see that as, hey, that's just that, that belongs to the Lord before it gets taxed, before it comes to us, any of that right. kind of stuff. Um, and then by God's grace, um, he's given us enough that we also get to give to some other causes. Um, yep. That we that we like and appreciate, but it's beyond those things. So when we go back to the person's question, the person's question, right, is um, 
can I split my 10% between the church and other causes? So we've already said, all right, let's not get legalistic about that 10% number as if it's a bill to right. pay and you get yeah. to split it between a couple of different causes. Let's not, let's not view it that way. Let's, let's think about New Testament, um, kind of heart of generous giving. Um, and then as we think about those causes, I, again, would go back to just that Old Testament principle of, of the tithe and that, I mean, I think the Lord has called us to give that 10% to his work, his unique, specific gospel preaching work in and through the church, um, as well as giving to other causes. Totally. And, and if you go on social media, you're going to find a whole bunch of Christians out there railing against the tithe. They say, stop tithing, stop tithing. And what they're, and then if you watch the video, it'll say, you know, you need to just discern from the Lord an amount to give. Like, I think what they're saying, what they're trying to do is they're trying to, they're trying to diminish a legalistic approach to giving, which I can appreciate. Um, they're also pushing back on all these televangelists who have, who have been so deceitful and robbing mm. people of money, um, calling them to a biblical mandate that's not actually biblical. So, I mean, I can appreciate that, but. Um, we need to stop listening to cynical voices. We need to stop listening to um, voices that, how do I say it? Um, I mean, just that are, really aren't helpful. Opinionated. We need to stop listening to opinionated voices mm. and start seeking the counsel of your local body um, through the word and figure out what this is going to mean for your life. And so, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else I can say at the moment. No, um, that's really good. That's really good. Uh, like we've said a few different times, we're trying to balance that way between we don't want to be legalistic, but we also want to be clear about uh, kind of the principles yeah, so, that scripture calls. Yeah. Us so to. what I was to say was, it's not that we're trying to avoid this person's question. It's just the premise is faulty. Um, that we've got this 10%. God's called me to give exactly 10%. What, what's my way to, to, to give that that's still faithful? And we say, let's go back a moment and let's examine this whole notion of 10% um, and just say, is that really the mandate that scripture is requiring of you? Or is that a principle that we see and now we get to follow? And what does it mean to follow that principle? Yeah. Good. Yay. Money. Yay. <laughs> Always a fun topic. That's right. Man, this is going to get a bunch of comments today right now. Whenever I speak on money, like, and I, it just only gets proved more and more true, especially as the bigger we get. Every stinking word is examined yeah um seriously i'm I, I, like i can talk about hell and how your pet um i could say i could say your pet's going to hell because jesus didn't die for animals i could say that and no one would care like no like i won't get a comment <laughs> uh, but i talk about how christians are supposed to give and man i tell you what you get a thousand excuses about why this person yeah, doesn't right. feel yeah so so to, 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 all right. So let me just take a second and say this. When a person tries to argue giving less than 10%, I've never had a person, um, come to me with that mentality who for me, um, felt like they were trying to get out of something that mm. they knew they should do. Um, or they were trying to, it just, it never, it, it never felt right to me. Um, now there's, you know, there's been times people have, have come to me with that and said, you know, the Bible says that we can give more, that we're supposed to give more, we're supposed to give a lot. Then I'm like, yeah, okay. And that, yeah, absolutely. Then yeah, the, the 10% is a great base to build from and starting point, right? It's not the finish line, it's the, it's the starting line. And so there's, there's that aspect of it. But um, many times it's people are like, well, I don't have to give anything. The Bible says I don't have to give. Jesus died so I don't have to follow the law anymore. You know, well, the main one I was expecting people have in their minds is, uh, does my Christian school tuition count as my tithe? That's okay, what, dude, my, I'm so tender now. Okay. I was okay. Expecting in my mind um, in there. All right. If I you don't know that <laughs> we should even talk about that or not, but <laughs> well, so, okay. So the, I think the answer that that's a faulty premise, but let me just say this. My most memorable moment in seminary is when I saw, Oh um, yeah. You told, you've told me this yeah, before. Yeah. When, um, I saw two, to, um, a person's, a person said that, um, they said it was, it was a, it was a gal who was seeking an MDiv, uh, cause she wanted to be a pastor. And she said in the class, cause we're talking about tithing. She said, my husband and I do tithe, but it's our children's education to Christian schools. And it was like, I'd say two thirds of the class were like, yeah, yeah. Cause I went to a, I went to Calvin, I went to Calvin, yeah. you know, CRC has a big emphasis on that, um, or at least in West Michigan, I've heard. And so, um, but there's a few of us in the class were like, wait, is that, 
is that true? Like, is that, is that actually okay? And then the professor looked at her like, I have to address this now. Like, oh crap. I have to, like, I have to push back on this. This is wrong. He's like, he's like, no, that's, that's not, that's not your tithe. That's, that's a wonderful thing that you do. I fully affirm it. Uh, I think it's worthy, uh, worthy to sacrifice other things to see that happen for your family. But uh, you cannot say that that's giving to God. So, okay. okay so here's the thing. Um, one of the things I think is a really, a, a, a great thing about Peace Church is that we don't shove one form of education down our throat, right. down anyone's throat. We've got, we've got people here who do public school, homeschool, charter school, private school, Christian school. And we say, God bless you. Discern from the Lord what's best for you and your, for your family. And I want like every, no matter what a family chooses, I want them to know that as long as I can ensure that you've sought the Lord on this and you are engaged in your, your children's education, because I think you can check out, you can send your kids to Christian school and check out. You can send your kids to public school and check out. Um, as long as you are prayerful in your decision and engaged in your education, then I, then I trust whatever God's led you to, to do. And so I don't want people to hear us say that money given to your children's Christian education does not count as a tithe. I don't want them to hear that as um, that, that we don't um, bless their decision to send their kids mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. Christian school. I, I think that's a very admirable, admirable, sacrificial, um, wise decision for your family. Um, but I don't think you can say my money given to that expense counts now as the tithe. I mean, we know people who have, ch who believe so much in going to peace church for their family. They gave up getting support from their local church. Yeah, um, totally. Like they, they, if they stayed at the local church, yeah. they would have gotten money to help with their Christian education. They gave that up because they believe that God's called them to yeah. the ministry of peace. And so that's why I'm just really cautious to like, I want to make sure it's really clear that while I don't believe you can say money given to your Christian's education counts as your tithe or, or to the Lord. Um, I do still affirm people's decision if that's what they feel like their uh, call, right call is for their yeah, family. Yeah, yeah, totally. All right, hey, next question. Is it okay for Christians to live together before they get married? Where in the Bible does it address this? So that notion of cohabitation, I don't think is like directly addressed, that it wasn't a thing back in those days. But I will say that I think you see that notion put to rest in Genesis. A man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. That's right. Um, not, not a man boy to venture out on his own and move in with his girlfriend um, while they figure out life together. Sorry, that's not. See if they're compatible. Yeah, no. That, uh, so I'd say, and then also you get things like, um, you know, in, in Hebrews talks about um, keeping the marriage bed pure. Mm -hmm. I think that's the language behind it. Yeah. And um, so that notion of like, yeah, you don't, you don't get into the marriage bed unless you're actually married. Yeah. And or even in scripture, other words like sexual immorality or fornication are words that sensuality. Even yeah. yeah yep. They specifically include things like sex outside of marriage. Yeah, that's absolutely. Um, whether that's temple prostitution or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, this whole notion of cohabitation, uh, I think you also just see, I mean, not that you need this, um, you don't need this to affirm what the scripture said, but the studies constantly are showing those who live together before they're married, their marriages don't last or they have very unhappy marriages. Um, it's not the way that God's designed. And that's proven to be true. When people step outside God's design, it does not benefit their life. In fact, it wreaks havoc on their life. And I would say by extension, the culture at large. Yeah. I think this is probably why, part of the reason why you see such um, rampant brokenness in marriages and families is because people don't value marriage. They don't respect it before they get married. And um, they try to act like they're married before they actually are. And so I'd say for me, that's just, yeah, I'm sad. I'm sad about how prevalent it is among Christians. Mm. That does make me sad. Um, and so just to going back, I think while you don't see thou shalt not cohabitate written in scripture, I think what you see is from the, the very earliest pages, um, a principle is set that's good and right and beautiful and glorifying to God and good for one another, that a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. I think that was an awesome, great, full answer, if I may. I've got just a couple of real quick ones which I just want to hit. First one is is this. What do you say to that that uh, argument that we have to figure out if we're compatible? I would say then, okay, that you, 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 you certainly do. 
Um, but you don't do that by living together and sleeping together. That's right. Uh, you don't do that by um, playing marriage when you're not actually married. You do that by spending quality time together, having gospel, God-centered conversations. Um, and that's how you do that. Um, yeah. You do that, yes, through spending time together, but you don't do that through living together. Yeah, that's good. Uh, one other one. If somebody were to come to you, and, I, and I've actually heard this before, somebody were to come to you and say, well, but what if we live together, but we don't have sex? Again, I would say uh, a man shall leave his father and mother, a.k.a. move out of his house and be united to his wife. Um, and so for me, it's, it's the, the uh, proclivity or the attraction or the temptation for sex is part of the reason why you shouldn't cohabitate. Yeah. Um, that's not the only reason you shouldn't cohabitate. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. When we, when we do premarital counseling here, we actually, if, if a couple is living together, we say you've got to, you got to separate yep. for the period of your premarital counseling of now until you get married. Um, and I've often, I've, I've offered a couple of times to guys to, to come move in with me if they got to, I mean, yeah. you gotta, you gotta separate, you gotta get away from, from that in order to. Yep. Same thing. That's, that's what I do. That's a standard here. We don't marry people who are living together. Mm -hmm. Um, because if you want one of our pastors to officiate your wedding, it's because you want to have a gospel Christ centered marriage and that starts in your engagement. Yeah. So as we talk about this, let me just add one thing for those who are listening, who maybe are cohabitating or maybe are spending, um, too many nights in a row at their boyfriend or girlfriend's house by doing this. Number one study show you're ruining your, your future marriage. If you are going to marry this person. Um, you're not setting your marriage up for success. And I would also say secondly, and even more importantly, you're in sin. God's not going to bless this. And you can't um, be pursuing the Lord and willfully living in this, pursuing this much sin. So our loving encouragement was, would be to say, God has, so much, God has something so much better for you. He wants you to be in a relationship that's flourishing, that's centered on him. And that's not going to happen if you are going against his will and you're living together or sleeping together or spending each other the night at each other's house. Um, so my encouragement for those who are cohabitating or who have a uh, temptation to be spending the night at each other's house or who are sexually active, stop, stop because um, you're actively choosing what's not good for you. You're choosing what's less for you. God has something greater and better for you. Mm. And if this person is somebody that you want to spend the rest of your life with, then start now and making by making your future marriage better. And that at least study wise says, stop living together. And scripture says, um, God's not going to bless that. I mean, God's going to bless the marriage that seeks him above all else. Yeah, totally. And we say that because we love you. We care about you. hundred percent. And if you're a parent or close friend listening and uh, have somebody in your life who, who you want to share that, that truth with, make sure you do so with love and with much prayer. Um, but you got to share it. If you care about them, share the truth. Yep. You should be, and also, I mean, on, on the flip, you should be with someone who wants to call you to a deeper level of faith mm. and to get closer to God. And if they're sleeping with you or living with you or asking for that or vying for that, then they're not seeking what's God, God's best for you. They're seeking probably mm. selfish desires. Um, if they really want what's best for you and if you really want to marry a Christian person, then they're going to be pointing you and calling you to the standard that Jesus has set for us, which is good and right and beautiful. Mm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ryan. Thanks, Pastor John. Thanks, everybody, for listening. It's great to get to uh, share and talk about God's Word together. If you have questions, please submit those to peacechurch.cc slash questions. You can also rate and review this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, and be sure to share it with a friend so we can help more people grow in their walk with Jesus. Thanks, everybody. You can find That's a Good Question at resoundmedia.cc or wherever you listen to podcasts.